Welcome back to Time Out with the Sports Doctor podcast, where life, sports, and medicine intersect. We're very glad that you continue to support this podcast. You can get the information on any platform uh, where podcasts are played, as well as getting the video content on YouTube. But if you want to just get one place to find all the content, go to my website at drgarrickthesportsdoctor.com and you will find everything on that website. So without further ado, let's get into this episode. All right, so welcome back to another episode of Time Out with the Sports Doctor podcast. And we have another very interesting guest. Actually, I've been on her podcast, or I don't know if it's released yet, but we recorded together previously for her podcast. So now she's returning the favor for me. So uh, let's welcome Dr. Rebecca Lauderdale to the show. Oh, thank you so much. It is such a pleasure to talk with you again. Absolutely. And, you know, I want to compliment you on your podcast interview that I had with you because you really took some different angles that, you know, I wasn't really even expecting going into the podcast, being able to talk and share some things about my family and history of my family and my grandfather. So that was really a unique perspective. So, you know, I appreciate that interview and I'd like to share that with my uh, podcast audience at some point. I will be happy to share that audio with you. And I love to do it. I love talking with you about that. I think it's so fun to talk about those those things about ourselves that we usually don't get opportunities to to talk about. Absolutely. So you work also in South Mississippi as an internal medicine physician, uh, but you're also a speaker and a podcaster. So just kind of give us a brief introduction of yourself. Yeah. So I am a lifelong Southerner. Um, I was born in Pascagoula. And then I started elementary school in Petal. And then we ended up way up in the Delta for several years of my childhood and then back down to the coast. And I trained, I, I did my medical training at the University of Mississippi in Jackson. And as soon as I finished residency in internal medicine, I came back here to Hattiesburg because I just love the Pine Belt. And I've been here ever since, ever since 2007. So I practice internal medicine and um, a lot of people are like, I'm not really sure what that is. And that that right. means I'm a primary care doctor for adults. One of the things that I did my the first several years I was in practice was I was a hospitalist. So I did only care for people in the hospital. But now I take care of people who are primarily 65, like the Medicare set, people who have a lot of chronic medical illnesses, and I try to help keep them healthy. Yeah, so you've actually had an interesting perspective of Mississippi from several angles. Sounds like you moved from, you know, this Pine Belt area to the coast and then up to uh, North, you know, Mississippi. So kind of talk about the differences that you might've experienced in those different areas. So, and I, I'll have to preface this by saying that, you know, I haven't lived in North Mississippi in the Delta specifically, which is a very, has a very particular sense of place and a very particular sort of culture. But I, you know, I haven't lived there since I was 12. So, you know, I was young. I was, you know, eight to 12. Um, School age, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I lived, I don't remember living in Pascagoula when I was, uh, when I was little, I mostly remember that kind of younger childhood in Petal. And I felt, you know, I have a wonderful family that loved me well. We didn't have a lot of resources, I guess you could put it that way, but I never knew that. And I had a pretty diverse school experience. I, you know, I think when comparing notes with other people my age, and I'm in my mid-40s, people who went to school in the early 80s in Mississippi, I had a pretty, you know, a diverse group of friends. I, I didn't feel like socioeconomically, there were, I even was aware of differences in the kids that I went to school with. And there were different kind of racial and ethnic backgrounds. And I found that all very interesting. When we moved to the Delta when I was eight years old in the third grade, my parents kind of made a deal when my dad got a job there that they would pay for myself and my sister to go to a private school, which is something that they otherwise couldn't have afforded, but they were concerned because there's a significant change, a significant difference in the quality of the public school education down here in the Pine Belt in the Delta, unfortunately, because school systems are tied to property taxes and there was a lot of white flight in the, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s um, when desegregation happened. And so there, there were a lot of resources that left the public schools in the Delta. And so I attended private school. I've never been in a private school. It was all white. 
and it was all people. And I'm, you know, I'm a white woman for people who aren't watching this on video. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a white woman, but my family's socioeconomic status was su substantially lower than the other kids that I went to school with. And from day one, they let me know I didn't belong there. And I heard someone talk about this a couple of weeks ago. It was a TikTok video. I'm not, I don't remember who it was, so I can't attribute it to anybody, but this concept of the South being a high context society, that there are like these contextual rules that you have to follow. And if you aren't from that place and you haven't grown up with these contextual rules, but the certain ways that you have to do things and the certain ways that you have to say things, then you kind of get socially, you know, you get ostracized. And so I went from feeling like kind of very comfortable about who I was a young child. My family loved me. I had a great time at school and into this place where all of a sudden I was a pariah and I didn't understand why I didn't get it. And those years there have Later on in my life, after leaving and going back to something that I felt a lot more comfortable for me, mm -hmm. for better or for worse, helped me to be very attuned to the people around me who felt like they were out of place, to people who didn't fit in, who weren't being treated the same. And that's one of the reasons that I started this podcast called Belonging in the South, A Guide for Misfits. And it's that, you know, I've recognized in myself over the years, the desire, this kind of tendency that we, I think we all have, but particularly white folks to kind of center ourselves in an experience, you know? So like, if I see someone of color who's being treated differently, I kind of want to identify with that and then tell my own story rather than just giving their, get, letting them tell theirs. Sure. And I've grown and I have become so fascinated with hearing the stories of people who have found that transition between being, feeling out of place and feeling separate and letting that define them. And then that transition into being yourself, being vulnerable, being willing to be who you are, regardless of what the people around you think which then leads to this, this sense of belonging that you didn't expect. And so that's the purpose of my podcast is not to talk about myself so much as it is to really kind of open up and let us hear about all these, all the people who live around us in the South so that we can, you know, maybe make, maybe make our communities into even bigger hearted places than they all already are. Well, thank you for your, you know, for sharing that story, number one, because like you mentioned before, belonging, and we will talk more about that word belonging, but as a minority, when you're living in the South, unless you're in a couple of areas, especially as you start to go into professional school and get into the workforce as a professional, you're going to be the minority. And many times people can't really identify with that, or many times people can't really relate to that. Um, but like you mentioned early in life, you did have an experience that allowed you to feel like a misfit, even though you by race and by, you know, gender or whatever it may be, you should have fit in, but you felt that, mm -hmm. I guess, kind of pain of being an outcast or being a misfit of sorts. Um, because as an orthopedic surgeon, we make up less than African Americans make up less than 2% of practicing orthopedic surgeons. So it's very common for me to go to a meeting or go into a room where I'm the only person that looks like myself. So I get used to that, but many people that are in the majority never have to really face that situation at all. And I think, you know, one of the, a turning point for me was as a woman in medicine and being in, you know, kind of in leadership over the past, you know, five, 10 years, being in positions where I was the only woman in the room, you yes. know, and realizing realizing how how that worked against me in ways and kind of having to admit that that was true, even when I didn't want to. I had this internalized, almost like an internalized misogyny, this idea that, oh, oh no, 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 those people have my best interest in mind. And I just, you know, I just need to, <laughs> I, I need to let them be the authority. Um, and I, maybe I just don't know best for myself. That was what had kind of I had been taught and having to realize that, no, actually what we need is just more diverse voices in this room because 
we've got this one set of perspectives. The dynamic range is really, really narrow and small, and it's not working for everybody. And it's not because there's necessarily anybody that's purposefully acting, and sometimes they are, but that they're perfect purposely acting against people who are different than them. They just don't know any better. And how that gets fixed is by having different voices in the room. And then I can take that experience and think, oh, wow, what must this be like for a woman of color in this room? Or, you know, any sort of diversity, a disability, anything. And that I just, I try to always remember that there may be somebody else in the room who's feeling the same way that I am. And let's see how we can work together to amplify our voices. But yeah, I think I have second guessed myself in putting myself out and kind of admitting that at times I've felt a lot like a misfit because, but like you said, like, I look like I should just fit in, you know? Right. But I think it's important for all of us to know there's a lot of us who feel like we don't fit in. There's a lot of ways that we cannot fit in and being willing to share who we really are with in safe places. It just benefits all of us. Yeah, because truly, if you can be comfortable with who you are, the world needs you in the state that you are. They need you as a unique individual, not you trying to fit in, uh, which brings me to the next point of kind of discussing belonging versus fitting in. So if you could kind of speak to that difference, in your opinion. Yeah, so I'm 46, <laughs> probably, I don't know, 36 to 40 years doing mostly the fitting in part and not really knowing that there was an option to do something different. And so so when when psychologists and social scientists talk about belonging and fitting in, like when they they actually kind of define this idea of belonging and it is an essential one of those irreducible needs of humans. We need food and we need shelter, we need physical safety. We also need this thing called belonging because that's how humans survive and thrive is in the support of a group of other people. And there's always this sort of balance between being individuals and being a group. But belonging is when you are accepted by a group of people, however large or small, for who you actually are, for who they know you to be. The other side of that is that you can't really belong with a group of people if you won't show them who you actually are. So it requires work on your part and on theirs. Fitting in is when you kind of fit with the social norms of this group. And so you could belong and fit in at the same time. But in a lot of situations, we make a choice to fit in because we don't belong. And there may be a group of people we are working with or, you know, whatever socially that we want to belong with, but who won't really accept us for who we are. And so we just kind of go along. That's the status quo. Keeping up with the Joneses, kind of keeping up appearances and not really letting people see who you are out of fear of rejection. And there are some places where the only person you can belong to is you. And yeah, like it is a hard thing sometimes to accept that with a certain group of people, you're just going to belong to yourself and that's all you can do. But if you don't ever take the step to share who you really are with somebody, you take a, you know, take a vulnerable step, then you don't belong anywhere and you feel lonely. And that's, you know, we have an epidemic of loneliness or, you know, a surgeon general has written a book about it. And I think that a lot of this, it comes to bear on that. So you mentioned pretty much that you spent almost three quarters of your life kind of on the fitting in side. What was the trigger to make you say that, hey, there's more to life than this? Oh, so that's a, that's a, that's not a tough one. I know the answer right off the top, you know, right off my head. So I've talked about this when I speak to groups of physicians about burnout. So, you know, burnout is this phenomenon that has become, we've talked about it a whole lot since the pandemic started. Correct. Burnout is a, it's associated with your profession, kind of with your occupation. And there is a, you know, a real definition. There are different aspects to burnout. You can test it. And it happens when you're exposed to constant amounts of stress that you don't have the resources to mitigate. And, and, you're, and it's over time and it develops into, at its worst, extreme depression and sometimes even suicide. In physicians, where I know the most data, uh, but I think this is true for everybody, you know, burnout happens because 
we don't have resources. We have too much work to do in too little time, not enough appreciation and connection with the people we work with. We have inefficient work systems. There are so many things that contribute to it. But that happened to me in 2013 or so. And I didn't know what to call it, but I was profoundly depressed. I worked a seven on seven off schedule and I could go to work and make everybody think that I was fine and I could do my work, but then I could go home and on the weekend I could literally couldn't get out of bed and I didn't know why, like what's going on. And, you know, <laughs> now when I think back on it, I was like, how did I not know, you know, but were you I, working nights or days or did it really days, but they days. were hard days. And so I realized that the environment of my work, at first I tried to change it. You know, I tried to change myself to, you know, right. to, you know, be able to do the work better. And then I realized that the system was not going to get better. It was too poisonous to me and I had to just leave it. And the thought of that to me meant I was a quitter. And so that's why it took me so long to admit that that's what I needed to do. So when I got to that just really, really low point, I found your listeners may be familiar with this person, Brene Brown. She's a PhD social worker. She started out studying like shame and vulnerability and belonging. And mm -hmm. she did a couple TED Talks. And I happened to hear one of her TED Talks. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's what's happened to me is shame. I didn't know about shame. I didn't know right. that that was the reason that I wasn't you know, that I wasn't happy that I didn't have fulfilling relationships because I'm not sharing anything about who I am. I'm scared to be who I am. Medicine teaches us not to be weak. There are a whole lot of social norms and cultural aspects to medicine and medical training that don't allow us to be vulnerable. And so I learned a lot about that by asking some folks who were my friends at the time, if they would spend some time with me talking about her material, like she had a, like a book or an online course or something. And that group of people, we are still meeting almost every week now. And this, I don't know, seven or eight years now. Um, and I've learned so much about friendship and about myself um, and about loving other people just through getting to that incredibly low point where I felt like I just couldn't even, there wasn't even anything else I had to lose. So I could just risk you know, quitting my job and doing something different. And it was the best thing I ever did. And like you mentioned, you know, finding community and finding people that are like-minded is uh -huh. what's so important because many times I, I mentioned this a lot is that we suffer in silence. Um, and we, especially as healthcare providers, we feel that we have to be there for other people, but who's really there for us. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing that's very important for the listeners to hear that, you know, no matter what you're doing, somebody else is probably experiencing, whether it's good or bad, something similar to what you're going through. Absolutely. And it's really, you know, important to try to identify that community or that tribe to really um, grow with together. If you're enjoying this episode, don't wait to the end to share it. Share it now. Share this with a friend or a colleague that you think might find value in this information. And then also, Make sure that you click and leave us a five-star review and give us feedback because we really value your feedback and your input. Now back to the episode. I didn't realize how much a group of close friends like that would change my life. But even when they're not physically around you, you have something difficult to do you know, you've got people that have your back, you know, yeah. it makes all the difference in the world. And I think, I don't know if maybe some of your listeners might identify with this too, but so my father is a minister and being in a minister's family growing up, there's a very different dynamic in the type of friends that you're able to have as a minister and a minister's wife, because you're in this position that's kind of held apart. and so. I, even though my parents were wonderful, and I think there are so many people who would say that they impacted their lives and in, in positive ways, they didn't have a community of friends like that. They had people that they ministered to, 
but they didn't have the reciprocal a lot, you know, in not in that way where they could just really be themselves, if that makes sense. Uh, so they could yeah, just I think, really be honest. Sure, especially have, in the South, right? Where yeah. religion is so important and, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so they're in a small town and everybody knows who goes to this church and who goes yeah. to that church and everybody knows the preacher's kids. You know, I always yeah. remember hearing that in, kid, in school. You know, you're expected to be this certain way. And, and so, whole, you know, that I didn't see how impactful this kind of vulnerable, open friendships, you know, relationships could be. And so I did, just didn't know. I didn't really know how to be a good friend until I was, you know, 40. <laughs> Yeah, no, hundred percent. Now let's talk about that kind of your self concept and self valuation, and how that plays a role in how you show up for other people. Oh yeah, so there is this really interesting study that was done. A couple of studies that were done on this is this is on physicians. It's been within the past three years. They developed a kind of a questionnaire tool that they validated through their research board to help grade physicians on what they called self-valuation. And the questions in the questionnaire were things like, you know, I, I put off taking care of my own health for the care, for caring for others. I didn't sleep because I was taking care of other people. I am critical of myself when I make mistakes, those sorts of things. So not just actions, but a mindset of how you right. think about kind of yourself. Self-talk. Yeah. And they found this. It's just like, it's fascinating when you look at the numbers, but a direct inverse correlation with burnout. That when you look at the rest of the population, like you look at the general population, the general population has a certain amount of burnout, but physicians' burnout levels are significantly higher. Well, physicians are really resilient. And that's the whole idea everybody kind of bounces around is that you need to be resilient so you don't get right. burned out. But physicians are really resilient. And when they measure resilience, even the highest resilience, people who scored perfect on the resilience scale who were physicians, they still had burnout rates. But when they corrected for this self-valuation thing, the difference with the general population completely went away. And I, that is, when I saw that, it felt so validating because when I finally decided, I was like, you know, this whole self care thing sounds a little bit touchy feeling. Yeah. Oh, this is a little bit, you know, I'm not sure it's about a little this. soft. Yeah. It's just a little bit soft. I'm not sure I like this, but there's all these people who say that it'll make a difference and I'm miserable. So I've got to do something. So what I did was I promised myself that I was like, okay, you get six months, you get six months to work on this and I'm going to stop beating myself up about my weight. I'm going to stop beating myself up about my appearance and I'm just going to focus on trying to accept who I am. And it changed my life. I mean, it changed my life. And that was, those are some of the things that my friends and I talked together about those first several months that we met was that how hard that was. But when we saw each other doing it and we could support each other doing it, it made it easier. And now it's just the norm. Now the thought of going back to that just feels so sad. And I see it. Oh my goodness. It's just like every day, Even my patients who are, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, I still have people who will talk bad about themselves to me. And I just want to just reach out and say, no, you, you, you're precious just how you are. Like, you don't have to change a single thing. And once you realize that it opens this whole world up to you that you didn't know was there. So after you were able to find more self-awareness, how do you feel that that helped with your ability to take care of other people and your patients? So I heard someone say once that you can only love other people as much as you can love yourself. And at first on the surface of that, I thought, eh, I'm not sure about that. I love my kids and I love them more than I love, you know, myself. Anything, right. But, but when you think about like, what we tend, the example that she gave, that Brene Brown gave in her presentation when she talked about that was, you know, we tend to be, if we're happy in our own skin, we're not judging anybody else's. 
But if we're unhappy in our own skin, we tend to really judge other people for the same things that we feel shame about, that we feel that we fall short in. Um, And it sounds like such a cliche, but it is absolutely true. And so, you know, with my kids, if I'm worried about how I look, then I'm going to worry about how my kids look. But if I'm okay with how I look, I'm okay. I want them to be okay with how they look too, as they are. And so I've found that to be really true. And I've found it to be true in my practice. So with patients, I had a patient ask me the other day, she's lived in uh, the Hattiesburg area for two or three years after being away from Hattiesburg most of her adult life. And she moved back, I think, to care for a family member who was ill. And she hasn't had very much of a support system. And she's had a lot of judgment for herself. And she asked me, I was leaving the exam room and she said, hey, can I ask you one more question? And I said, well, sure. And she said, when you look at me, what do you see? And first of all, I was like, wow, I like, I feel really honored that somebody would think to ask that I'm safe enough to ask that question of right. that back down and I closed the door and I said, you know, I told her what I saw. I said, I see this beautiful, strong woman who, you know, I mean, you've taken care of your family. You're taking good care of yourself. You're concerned about your health. That's what I see. And she's like, are you sure? I don't see those things in me. And I said, well, how many people do you have around you that are reflecting that back to you? And she just stopped and she said, not, not very many. Yeah. And that's, that's why, you know, we need other people to tell us when we can't tell ourselves. Yeah, as you said that, I thought about how privileged we are, number one, as medical providers to be able to enter into people's safe space, right, into areas of people's lives that, you know, they would not dare tell anyone else or, you know, yeah. we're, we're seeing them at this, some of their worst points and mm-hmm. from an illness standpoint or even a depression standpoint. Um, and it's a very vulnerable time for them in their lives. So we're very privileged to be able to enter into that space. And if we're not, like you mentioned before, if you're not healthy enough, you can carry their burdens as well um, in many instances, or you won't be able to really identify or help them. You're thinking about just getting through the day or you Mm -hmm. you easily could have said, well, you know, that has nothing to do with your visit. (laughs) Right. Uh, I got got somebody next door. Right. Would would you like a psych referral or would you like to, you know, a counseling referral? Yeah. So, but that's, in many situations, that's how it's designed on to the next one. I got 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 12 minutes, 12 minutes, whatever. And you got to keep it rolling. So you're not behind. And I think that's one thing, modern healthcare, uh, we're being forced into some of these situations where you, it's hard to care for the total need of the patient. Um, Mm -hmm. You are able to care for whatever is on that sheet of paper and nothing else. Uh, which can be difficult as a provider to adjust to as well as difficult on our patients as well. Right. And I think that goes, you know, back to the the things that cause burnout for physicians is this demand of the demand, the work demand um, that exceeds the capacity, you know, the time or the resources that we have. And if you're slowly draining your tank and you don't recuperate physically, mentally, spiritually, on a regular basis, then you can't give that back to your patients, you know, like you just can't. And so I, I know, you know, a lot of doctors who, especially during the pandemic, I mean, the effect of, the effect of patients' deaths. And for us, you know, I didn't get trained what to, how to process the grief right. of a patient's death. I mean, what we did was our attending said, okay, let's move on to the next one. Or else they just ask us all the things we might have done wrong. Right, <laughs> you know, right. Let's debrief what went wrong here, but let's, you know, we're not going to talk about how this person that we cared for, you know, is gone. And, you know, how do we deal with that grief? And so, so many of us don't know how to do that. And we have difficulty. Sometimes it's impossible to draw boundaries. I mean, if you are an employed physician and you have somebody else, you know, telling you what your production needs to be and those things, you just really don't don't have control over it. I think that's why it was like 20% of physicians last year in a survey said they were planning to leave the profession in the next three years. Which is going to make Scary. capacity worse and leave a void for patients. Okay. Um, but I was listening to something. I can't remember if it was an audio book or someone else podcast, but it mm-hmm. said capacity, you know, we embrace that as being a personal problem, but that's a system issue. Absolutely. And it's, it's the role of the system to expand, 
you know, providers or expand right. capacity for patients, but we take it on as we need to do more or yeah. see more or treat more that's people. How, you know, that's how we get trained in medical school and residency teaches us just to do more and more and carry as much as they can load on you. And so even if you get out into a private practice, even if you are the one calling the shots, a lot of times because we because of how we're trained, we don't realize that we don't have to do these things. We don't have to sacrifice ourselves in the process. So yeah, that, that's something that I think is really important to get a, get physicians to buy into, especially because there's been such a shift from self-employment to being employed by health systems in the last right. few years. Um, Absolutely. You know, that shift from 70% were independent, 30% were employed to the exact opposite now. And that's had a real impact on physicians. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, on Time Out with the Sports Doctor, this is your final time out. So <laughs> I just want you to speak to, you know, another healthcare provider or, you know, it doesn't even have to be a healthcare person, but someone who might be saying, you know, it doesn't, the way I look at my job or my occupation is not the same. I'm feeling these symptoms of depression. I don't really know what depression is 100%, but I don't feel right with what I'm doing. So just kind of speak to them about, you know, where to start is trying to get out of that dark place. Oh, yeah. So what I would say to you, those of you who feel like you're just, you're emotionally exhausted, you're physically exhausted, it's hard for you to find empathy for your patients. First of all, that doesn't mean you're a bad person. This yeah. is a system problem that is happening to so many physicians because it's a system problem and it's not a personal failing. And we know it's not a personal failing because you can move people along the continuum of burnout by changing their environments. And so you're not a bad person. You're also not a quitter if you decide that you've got to do something differently. So, you know, I think the first thing is just knowing that, beginning to even consider accepting the truth of that. And then talk to somebody who is an unbiased party who you can just say all the stuff to that may be a therapist if you can't afford a therapist or access a therapist find a pastor a close friend somebody who's just going to listen to you sometimes just getting it out and saying it helps clarify some things and then the next step is begin to take care of yourself in even in small ways you know say no i'm i'm going to get enough sleep Talk with your partners if you have partners in your practice and see if they're experiencing the same thing. And that can be hard to do in medicine because sometimes people won't admit it, even when they are experiencing right. it. And sometimes places just are not going to change for you and getting out is the only thing you can do. But sometimes That's you can change things from the inside. And there are a lot of really wonderful physicians who are doing work in the area of burnout in the things that actually do make a difference. And it's not like yoga and meditation. Um, it's real changes in the system. And so like the AMA has a lot of actual like modules you can just log into and it'll give you a module on how to help, help get some of the workload off of you uh, and let your team handle things for you. For example, there are other things as well, but another thing is take a vacation, go do something fun. You may not have done that in a long time, but go do, go do something fun. And when you get back from something like that, it makes a big difference in clarifying what you want to leave in your life and what you need to take out. Yeah, no, I agree with that. And thank you for sharing number one um, and tell people how they can follow your podcast and kind of follow with what you have going on in your career. Yeah. So I have, so belonging in the South, a guide for misfits. You can get it any of your favorite podcasting platforms and you can find me. I'm Dr. Lauderdale, like Dr. Lauderdale on Instagram and TikTok. And I'm also on Facebook, just Rebecca Lauderdale. So if you friend me, I'm, I'm going to look into who you are before I say yes on there. <laughs> <laughs> The other places I do post some kind of additional content and things like that on Instagram and TikTok. But if TikTok gets banned, I'm on Instagram and Facebook. There um, you go. Yeah. You got you got a fallback plan. Right. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again for coming on and can't wait to hear my episode on your podcast. And mm -hmm. if, you know, I can collaborate or do anything for you, please let me know. Uh, thank you. That means a lot to me. Thank you for continuing to support this podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, then please leave a five-star review. And if you haven't done so, subscribe so you continue to get the updated episode. Until later, peace. Hey, time out with the sports doctor.
I'm with the sports doctor. Uh -huh. Keep our head right in the game. We ain't never stopping. You are now tuned in. Trust, you don't want to miss. This is where life, sports, and medicine is.